Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Buy me toys. Um, I love her most because she does lots of things for me and she cares for me. She does lots of things for me. She plays with me too. Buys me ice cream. She fixes my hair and it makes my hair look beautiful. Breakfast. Breakfast. Um, when she feeds me, she makes super good food. She buys me toys and she buys me candy. She helps me with my stuff that I didn't know. She helps me with ABC Mouth. She teaches me that not to fight. She helps me be stronger from going to the gym and working out. And it's never good to fight anyone older than you because they, they could hurt you bad. <laughs> I love you, Mom. Love you, Mom. <laughs> well, good morning, good morning, and uh, happy Mother's Day to all my mothers that are out there, and uh, welcome to those joining us online. You know, I want to do something a little special. I know my guys came out and they did the rah-rah for you mothers, but I want you to stand up because I want to pray for you. So all your moms, stand up. All your grandmas, stand up. And let me, let me also say, if you are a female and you are depositing in the next generation and that's something that you're doing, I want you to stand up because this prayer is for you, okay? Now, all those that are seated, just kind of reach your hands forward. I believe there's power when you demonstrate that. All right, and we're going to pray for these, these gals. Father God, I thank you for the women that are standing, Lord. I thank you that they have given of themselves, Lord God, that they have sacrificed parts of their lives to deposit your love, to deposit your encouragement in the young people, in the generation that comes be after them, Father. And so, Lord, this is honoring to you, I know. And so today, Lord God, I ask that you would give back to them something very special, that you would put in them, Father, the ability to be connected with you and hear, the, yeah, hear that, hear your voice say, well done, good and faithful servants. Now I thank you for them, bless them, give them a good day of rest and encouragement in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You can have a seat. Now, we also had a gift for you, a little gift. Uh, I hope you got that coming in. Yeah, uh, and if you didn't, when you're going out, just see an usher and they'll hand one to you. Okay, well, guys, I am a mother uh, myself of three grown boys who are now men, right? Samuel, Jeremiah, and David. And about a year and a half ago, I finally got a girl. One of my boys got married, and I now have a beautiful daughter-in-law, Olivia, who I just enjoy. You know, all my kids I treasure with all my heart, and I love to encourage them. I love to, to just, yeah, love on them, champion them, be there for them. Uh, it's like, you know, what I do, right? It just comes out of who I am, how God has made me. And one of the lessons that I taught my children when they were little, and I remind them as they are adults now, is to remember who they are in Christ right? That their identity can never really be found outside in the world. It can only be found inside Christ. So in the spirit of Mother's Day weekend, what I've uh, prepared for you today is to be able to teach you how to, to learn your true identity in Christ. It's something that comes out of what I worked with my children, so I hope you're blessed with that. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but we are in a spiritual warfare for our identities, right? See, God has created our identities. He's uniquely made us and shaped us. And then Satan comes along and he's trying to distort it. He's trying to pervert it. He's trying to get our eyes off, twist our identity, our true identity. <coughs> and we need to be able to, to, to recognize that. 
So what are some of the ways that Satan does that? What are the, some of the ways that he turns and tries to get our attention off of our true identity? Well, he uses a lot of times to use our hurts and our pains and our disappointments in life. And he tries to distract us with that because if he can distract us with that, then he knows that, that he can make us or help us to feel inadequate or bitter or angry or resentful. And so then we start struggling with these feelings and then we get sidetracked because our focus is off our true identity and onto those things. Or I've seen Satan use people, use people's opinions and their words to really to derail us, right? And they could be good people in your life. They could be parents or a spouse or a teacher or a peer group. And their words kind of kind of shake us and we wonder who we are, right? And then I've used I've seen uh, Satan use the media and our culture a lot. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that we don't get bombarded with this message that, hey, don't be uniquely you. You need to be like somebody else, right? You need to dress like them. You need to talk like them. You need to have a home like them, right? Or drive their kind of car. And it's like the culture is molding us to what they value, to what they value. And so Satan is constantly using these techniques on us and he's trying to distract us from who we really were meant to be. And when we get our eyes off and, and he uses those techniques to get our eyes off of who God says we are, what happens is then we have, he has an opening to start to, to talk to us. And he starts to whisper to you and I, like he starts to say, you're not that really, you're not that important, right? You know what? you don't have the goods, you're not going to be able to do this. Nobody's going to ever love you or accept you, right? And so he starts to whisper to us that you're a failure. You're doomed to fail all the time. You're weak. You're powerless to really affect any kind of change. And you know, you keep messing up. And that thing, that big thing that you messed up, you're never going to be forgiven. You're never going to be forgiven. And now Satan knows he's winning when he gets you to start to, to uh, mimic and start to say his lies that he's telling you. He knows that he's got you on the ropes. He knows that he's about ready to come in and to steal and to destroy your true identity. And I tell you what, that taps into my mom's heart. And I'm like, I want to treat you like my kids. I'm going to say, don't you let it happen. Be aware that the enemy wants to come after you. And I'm here standing up here because I want to share with you today not to let Satan make advancements in your life, to stand up and to learn about who God has made you to be and to take your position on the wall, to take your lead from God. This is a very important message. It comes from my mom's heart, not a physical mom, but a spiritual mom, that you must know what's in heaven you do. You got to know. Now, I travel a whole lot with my ministry. And so what happens is um, I'm gone, I'm flying through the airport, and it, it, it always, I hate going to the airport because there's so many of these check places and they stop you. And somebody said to me a couple years ago, I said, Sharon, why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and get one of those global access IDs, right, that the Homeland Security put together so that you can fast track, you don't have to go through all that. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. So I made a... Um, appointment, I went, <laughs> it was a face-to-face -face meeting at an official office, and so they fingerprinted me, and then they sat down, extensive interview, an extensive background, finally, you'll be glad to know I passed, right, <laughs> and they gave me a number, and I can fly through the airport system now, right, I don't get stopped anymore uh, at all the different security uh, points, they let me go through, but let me tell you, when I was in that process, and they were fingerprinting me, they didn't just fingerprint one finger. Oh no, they did all five, right? All my fingers and my thumb. Why was that? Because they wanted to make sure that, that my identity <coughs> was accessible to me, to them and to me, that Sharon Mead was Sharon Mead. And so this whole idea of fingerprinting, I was thinking, gosh, that's how God does us. He wants us to know our fingerprints so that we are who we are. We know who we are, the true, true self. And so in my time of devotion the, uh, the past couple of months, God has been bombarding me with a scripture. And so I've taken all my teaching today and I've put it in this one scripture. I'm going to keep referring back to it. I think it has huge implications on who we are. It's on your outline. It's in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And it says this, you, 
You are a chosen people. Oh, I hear that. Okay, before I can go on, you see that word you there? I want you to take your pen or your pencil and I want you to cross out you and I want you to put your name in. So I would put my name Sharon, but you put Joan, you put Bill, you put, you know, Kalika, you put whatever your name is there, right? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. Once you were not a people, but now you are, you are the people of God. Once you were not, you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, that, that scripture that I just read you, those verses, right, they hold and housed for us very important concepts, and I want you to circle them, and I think I outlined them, or put an underline under them, I don't remember, on your outline, but if not, I want you to circle these, because this is what we're going to talk about. It says here, the first one, you are a chosen people. I want you to circle that word chosen. <laughs> Has great implication. Number, the next one is a royal priesthood. <laughs> and I'm going to explain that, but I want you to circle priesthood. The next one is a holy nation. Circle that word holy. Holy. Next is a people belonging to God. I want you to circle that word belonging. And lastly, it says, you have received mercy down further. And I want you to circle that word, receive mercy. All five of them, all five of those things I had you circle, they talk about your true identity. And we need to understand what that means for us. So I'm going to jump right into it today. And we're going to look at God's view of us in Christ Jesus. The first identity, your first fingerprint that I want you to be aware of is number one, I am completely accepted. This is huge. I am completely accepted. You see, this is vital for us to know because all of us have been wounded in our lives at some place, right? And usually that wounding comes from being rejected. Now, some of us more than others feel this woundedness, but we all have encountered it, and it could be in your school, it could be in your home, it could be with a spouse, right? We've all kind of encountered that, and it's, it's uh, deposited in us these deep wounds. And here you go, the truth of the matter is those wounds, we try to handle them ourselves, and so we start looking for acceptance with other people, right? We start to look for acceptance with other people. Now, I, I was thinking about this, and I thought about something I had witnessed with one of my sons when he was younger. We were at a family reunion, and he was about 14 at the time, and uh, I was sitting in the upper deck and down on the lower deck of this lake that we were at. My kids were out by the lake, and they were fishing, and the older kids, the older teens, the older adults, uh, young adults, they were sitting up there, and I heard one of them, because I was up further, I heard one of them start to go one of my sons, right, and started to say, hey, and tease him and say, I bet you can't eat that bait, right? He had live bait, he had tadpoles. And so I'm thinking to myself, I'm sitting back there thinking, not a problem. This kid, one of my sons, you know, he said, not a problem because he's persnickety. Everything he eats can't touch, right? He's very cleanliness minded. I'm thinking he's not going to do it. Next thing I know, that kid pops that little tadpole in his mouth, the little thing's wiggling. I'm like, oh my God, right? It's a little wiggling. And then he starts to chew it. I'm thinking, oh, and the older kids are like, oh, that's so cool, man, that's so cool. Of course, what do I do? I get up and I'm running outside, try not to look panicked. I'm like, you, I think I need your help in the house, <laughs> right? I think we're going to have this conversation, what's going to happen here, right? And when I got in there, I asked him, I said, why did you do that? He's turning green, by the way. I'm like, why did you do that? And he goes, I just wanted to be a part. I just wanted to be a part a part of the older kids. And I thought to myself, I get it. I got it then and I get it now. I understand that. I don't know about you, but I've done some crazy stuff like that in my life to get the approval of other people, right? And so this need to be approved, it's like it's down in our souls, right? We need this approval. So a lot of times we go looking for it, and especially when it's paired up with woundedness, it causes us so many problems. But yet that scripture, 1 Peter 2, right, verse 9 and 10, it talks about this. It says, you have been chosen by God himself. Now I want you to look at that word chosen. That's huge. You've been accepted. You're completely accepted by God. You've been chosen by him. Isn't that cool? Right? So now that feeds our soul. 
Well, how do you know for sure, Sharon, that we've been chosen? Because I want to show you this. Because God chose me before anything else. He has chosen you before anything else. In Ephesians 1, 4, we see he, which is God, chose us in him, which is Christ Jesus, before the creation of the world. And so I want you to think about this for a minute, okay? I want you to, to think about that before God created anything else, he decided to choose you. Before he created anything, he chose you, right, in Christ. So before he made planets, he chose you. Before he made the oceans, he chose you. That's what God does. Before he did anything, he chose you before, before his creation. And that speaks a lot about the acceptance and about the love that he has for us. He chose us. And that, my friends, is one of your first fingerprints that you need to remember. The second one here that is part of your true identity is number two, you are extremely valuable. I am extremely valuable. So you're not just completely accepted, you are very valuable to God. You know, you're priceless to him. Again, in 1 Peter 2, we see that he says, you are a holy nation and a people belonging to God. Both of those words that I had you circle, holy and belonging, what do they talk about? They are words of attribution that God gives to you. He says, you are this important to me, right? And so you see in these two words, great value. You know that word holy, we see that holy, that means extreme value, and we, we hear it often like the Holy Bible or the Holy Sepulchre, right? The Holy Land. What does that mean? It means it's not normal. It means it's extremely valuable, very precious. And then God says that you and I are holy, that our identity is, our true identity is found in the holiness. He says we're holy. We're extremely valuable to him. We're priceless, right? Now, if you were to think about, well, what makes something very valuable? Well, I've got two concepts for you about what makes something very valuable. What makes something very valuable is what somebody's, you know, what somebody, uh, it, somebody else has owned it, right? In other words, if you and I were to go to the thrift store, one of my favorite things to do, right? And we go looking around and we find two pairs of, of tennis shoes, right? And we look at them, one of them says, this belongs to Sheer Mead, and the other one says, this belongs to Steph Curry, right? Who are we going to choose? The one with Steph Curry because he's a famous basketball player. It added value to that ordinary thing. So my question is, who owns you? Who owns you, right? Who do you belong to? If you belong to God, that adds great value in your life. In Deuteronomy 7, 6, it says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God, very valuable, his treasured possessions. You're treasured. You're extremely important, right? Another thought I was having about this value is not just who owns us, but also it's about value is added when we get to see what somebody's willing to pay for something, right? So like if I asked you how much was your home worth, right? And you start thinking, I'm not a real estate agent, but I can figure it out. Your home is with worth what anybody's willing to pay for it, right? Not a penny more, not a penny less. It's what they're willing to pay for it. So then the question becomes, our value to God, what are you willing to pay for it, God? And we know that we are valuable because Jesus gave his life for us. Jesus gave his life for us. That's what he paid, that price. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You have been bought and paid for by Christ, so you belong to him. Do you see that? We have been bought, bought and we belong to Christ because he paid the, the price for us. He paid so that your life and my life that we would have access to forgiveness, that we'd have access to God's family. And so here's what I think. I think that Jesus shows us our value when he stretched out his arms and he let himself be nailed to the cross and he died for us. That shows how much we matter to God. That shows how much he values us. And so when you start looking at your identity, you need to know that you are extremely valuable. You're not junk because Jesus Christ died for you. See, there's so many people in this world and they tell us that we're not important, that we're insignificant, that we don't matter. But yet God stands up and says, you do, you are so valuable to me, I would give you my only begotten son. This is a value. And I don't know about you, but when I'm out in the world, I kind of get bumped around and I forget my value. 
And I love our new format for doing communion where we have it set up every week on this side of the auditorium because that's a touch point for me. I take my communion and during worship or after church, you know, I sit there and I remember the price that Christ paid for me. And when I'm taking that communion, it's a touch point that I am valued. It's part of my identity that God has for me and for you. So that's our next fingerprint. Now, the third one I want to bring you uh, awareness is number three, I am eternally loved. I am eternally loved. All right? And again, in our verse we've been looking at, 1 Peter 2, it says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. So it talks about us not knowing Christ and being far from him, being far from God and then finding Jesus, right? And ask him to be the leader of our life. And it says, because of that now, you have this special access. You have uh, special things that are happening in your life because you belong to God. And we can start to see how God feels about us. In Jeremiah 31.3 on your outline, it says, I, God, have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. And so what we're seeing here is that these characteristics that God loves us with, the everlasting love and the unfailing love, what does that mean? Well, that means that he loves you unconditionally. That means that he loves you unendingly. It continues on and on. These are huge for us, that he loves us unconditionally. So what does that mean? He loves me unconditionally. That means that he doesn't say, I love you because you came to church today. I love you because you help the poor, right? I love you because you're a good person. No, he just says, I love you, period, end, boom, right? And this is really hard for us to grab hold of. Why is it hard for us to grab hold of this? Because we don't really receive love like that very often, do we? Unconditional love, we don't get that very often. You don't really get it from your parents. You don't even get it from your spouse. My goodness, we don't even really give unconditional love. We always have a condition. I love you if, right? You need to be able to do this. And so we are conditioned to love conditionally. And so when God says, I love you, period, end, we tend to question that. We tend to look at it. But yet God says, I want you to grow in understanding that I love you unconditionally. And I'm never going to stop loving you. I'm not on and off. I don't wake up one day and say, hmm, am I going to love you? No. I'm going to love you consistently. I'm going to love you in the good days and the bad days. And again, God was calling to us to grow in that understanding. See, some of us, we've had parents who we didn't know what they were going to be like when they got up that morning. Would they be happy or sad with us, Right? Would they like us or hate us that day? We didn't quite know. And so then we walk into our adulthood and we start to think, hmm, does God like me today? Did I do enough for him today? Did I share Jesus enough? Did I hold my temper enough? Right? Jesus, do you love me today? And so we tend to have these questions in our heart, right? Because we have a hard time understanding that his love is unending. He loves you right now as much as he could ever possibly love you. He's not going to love you anymore no matter what you do, right? Because the love that he has is not based on your performance but on who he is, his character, right? That's how we know that he loves us because God is love. Because God is love, right? He doesn't just have love for you and I, but that he is love, that he is love. He loves us, right? And so we know because he loves us, we can see it in scripture that this is his character. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, God loves, it is, God's love is eternal and his faithfulness lasts forever. So what we see here is that that's how God wants to love us, take care of us. And so this is part of our true identity. It's part of our fingerprints that we are eternally loved. We need to grow in that understanding and walk with it. Now, the fourth fingerprint is that you and I are totally forgiven. I am totally forgiven. Again, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10 says this. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy. And what we're talking about there, God's mercy, is God has the right to punish us for our sins and our shortcomings, but he doesn't. 
Instead, he gives us mercy. And what that means is that he shows us compassion by giving us access to Jesus Christ so that we can be forgiven for our sins. That's cool, man. That's cool, right? So when you start to look at forgiveness, it's a hallmark of who we are. It's one of our fingerprints, right? So when we look at forgiveness, I want to talk to you about that because I think we get kind of messed up a little bit in our minds what forgiveness is. See, when you and I forgive somebody that sins against us, right, it's almost like we take a box and we set it out and, and somebody who has sinned as, against us or um, fallen short, caused us pain, whatever, <coughs> right, we take this little box out and we go, I'm going to forgive you. And we take the offense and we put it in the box, we put a lid on it, and we take the box and we put it in our closet, right? And we go on along, walking along in our life until that person sins against us again, until they do something to hurt us again. And we walk over to our closet, we take off the box, we sit down on the table, we take the lid out, we take the offense and say, look, I already forgave you once for this. I'm not going to do it again. You're not going to treat me like that. That's what we do with forgiveness. So have we really forgiven? Well, we said we did, but we did not forget. And that kind of forgiveness is what we project on God. Like when I mess up, I say, God, I'm sorry. But I, I think he's waiting for me to mess up again. But God doesn't forgive like that. God says that his forgiveness, when we ask for forgiveness for a sin, when we sin against him, he says he takes that sin and he throws it as far as the east is from the west. He takes a eraser and he erases it. It never exists. So if you say, God, do you remember when I was having a hard time and I did that? Well, I did it again. He's going to go, oh, I didn't know that. Huh. Right? I forgot. So it's like it's fresh and it's new all over again because he totally for, uh, forgives. He totally takes away. And so when you and I struggle with the guilt feelings, you know, like, like maybe, maybe the sin isn't going to be forgiven. And, and so we start to project onto God that somehow he's getting us back, right? That somehow I say, God, I'm so sorry. I, I messed up. Forgive me. And we know he says, yeah. But then we get, we, something will happen and we think, huh, that's God getting me back. Like I get stuck in a traffic jam, <laughs> right? That I wasn't expecting to get stuck in and I'm going to be late. And I, my mind goes, <laughs> He's getting me back. God is getting me back. Because I was so impatient, he's getting me back. He's like punishing me. Now I have to sit in this traffic. But yeah, that's not what God does. God doesn't punish us. God does not punish us. God loves us. He will discipline us, but he doesn't punish us, right, for sins. When we ask for forgiveness, he forgives them completely and he erases them. In Romans 8, 1, it says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, I don't want you to be condemned. I don't want you to have condemnation. I don't want you to think I'm going to come after you and get you and punish you because that's not who I am. I forgive you when you ask and I erase that. And guys, we can be assured of this, that we are forgiven because, on your outline, Jesus paid the price for my sins. Jesus paid the price for our sins. That's how come we can be so for sure about this. Ephesians 1, 7 says, For by the blood of Christ we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God? How great is the grace of God? Guys, we are forgiven people. That is a fingerprint. That is who your true identity is. And we need to learn to walk in that forgiveness. We need to learn to walk in that kind of forgiveness. And we need to ask Father to help us to forgive others like that. Now, the last aspect here I want to talk to you about, the last fingerprint of your true identity is I am fully capable. I am fully capable. In 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, it said, again, it says, you are a royal priest, and I'm going to come back to that, explain that. You are a royal priest chosen to tell about the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. All right? So this whole idea of a priest, God tells us right there, you're a priest. But you didn't know that, right? Did you know that you're a priest? That's what God says. He says, you are a priest. It says here, what he's referring to is if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you are a Christian, if you are born again, you're in the family of God, then he says that you are a priest. 
So that's pretty cool. So what does a priest exactly do, right? What does a priest exactly do? We don't use that language around here. Well, what a priest, what a priest does is priest, he represents mankind to God, and then he represents to the people who God is, right? So here you go. When I say that you're a priest, what we're, we call it around here is that you are a minister, right? So when I say you're a priest, you're a minister, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that you have access to the throne room of God. You can go and petition God. You don't have to have a priest. You don't have to have another person between you and God. You go directly to God. Why? Because the person that's over you is the high priest. That is Jesus Christ. So you can go and you can sit. You can boldly come into the throne room of God, the God of the universe, and you can sit and have a conversation with him. You're a priest. And then we are told that part of our identity is also to be a representation, to be an ambassador to our community. We're to go out and tell them of the night and day difference that God has made in our life, right? We're to go out and tell them. We're to represent that God forgives them, that God loves people, that they matter to him. That's part of our fingerprint. That's part of our priestly duties that we should do. And I know just as I'm saying that, some of you are going, whoa, wait a minute. It's hard enough for me just to sit and talk to God privately, and you're saying that part of my, my calling, part of my identity is to go out and to talk to other people about Jesus? Whoa, that's pretty heavy. I don't know if I can do that. How do I do that? Well, I want you first to acknowledge the fact that it's tough for you. And that Satan's lying, trying to tell you that you can't do it. And then I want you to step up. And I want you to realize that you can. Because the presence of Jesus Christ is in you. And whatever he directs you to do, he empowers you to do it. We see that in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. It says this. The capacity that we have comes from self? No. What does it say? God. It says God. That's, that's where the power is, from God. He, it is he who made us capable of serving the new covenant. In other words, it says that God has deposited himself in us, that the Holy Spirit lives in us and gives us power and strength to walk out and to accomplish everything that he asks us to do. And we are to walk in this encounter. That's part of our identity. You know, we, we talk about all the time, you saw in our status update about this growth track stuff that we're doing. Why are we doing that? Why are we taking so much of your time to talk about it? Because it's there that we're trying to help you to get to know who God is and, and to understand that you are connected with him in a special way and that you are, you are to be connected with his people. And so we take time to help you to understand that and, and to, to pray about that. And then we help you to understand the gifts and talents that God himself has placed inside of you and how to leverage those up and to use those to make eternal differences in people's lives. Guys, I can tell you, most people go through their whole life and, and they don't make eternal deposits, right? They go into heaven, they might know Christ, but they go into heaven a poverty person, right? Somebody without stuff because they haven't learned the importance of making sure that they make those heavenly deposits, those eternal differences that you and I were designed to make. And so I want to encourage you that you want to do that. You want to go in. You want to stand before the Lord and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You want to go before him and you want him to be able to say, you made a difference. See this? You helped this person come in to, to be here with you. They're now a sister, now a brother in Christ. You see this person? They were hungry and you fed them. You see this person? They were destitute and you cared. You see these children? Nobody cared about them and you cared about them. You gave them your life. That's what God wants from us. That's a word from God. He wants those things from us. He wants us to come in as the kid's king yelling, Woohoo! I can't wait to stand in front of you, Lord. Right? I can't wait to see what you have to say. You and I are capable of doing whatever God asks us to do because Christ lives in us. He lives in us. And in Philippians 4.13, one of my favorite verses, it says, I can do what? Anything through Christ who strengthens me. You and I can accomplish so much more than we ever thought possible, but we can't do it in our own strength. We have to realize that we have something called the Holy Spirit that gives us power to move and to be released. And I've talked to you about finding your identity, those five fingerprints. They're so important. See, if you could find those, if you could learn those, 
right? They will fast track you, just like they did in the airport with me where all the, the stops and the inconveniences, they just kind of, when we know who we are in Christ, it just fast tracks us right to his throne, right? And so you and I, we need to walk in confidence of our identity and who we are. So I'm not gonna just leave it here. <laughs> what do I want you to do today? Today I want you to commit to yourself to start saying what God says and to start calling out the lies of Satan when he starts to tell you all these things that you can't do, who you're not. And I want you to, to counterbalance that, to say, no, who does God say I am? And if you really struggle with that, I'm gonna give you homework. You know, this outline that I got for you today. I want you to take it home and put it on, put, take five cards, three by five cards, and then write on there, who does God say I am? What is my identity? And on the back side, I want you to write those scriptures, those encouraging scriptures. And then every day you get up, every day I want you to read them. Every night before you put your head on your pillow, I want you to read them. And I want you to hold on to them. I want you to pursue them until inside you begin to believe that positive uh, confirmation of your true identity. That my friends, that you are accepted by your God, that you are valued by your God, that you are so loved and you're forgiven and you can do anything because of God. This is who he's made you to be. This is your true identity. And this is a mother's heart for you, her spiritual children, that you would grab hold of that. And no matter what comes in your life, you know who you are. You know who you are. Now bow your heads with me. I'm gonna close in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for this simple message. How profound, though. Holy Spirit, you have been here and you have been moving. And I ask now, Lord, that you would continue to open up. See that? Open up our minds and our hearts, Father. <clears throat> Let us see your wisdom. Let us move. Teach us, Father. Teach us how to walk in the fullness of who you say we are. And I hear that. Father says there's some of you, you don't know me. You, you've never made that, that, you've never made the appointment to come before me. And so while every head is bowed and eyes are closed, those of you that don't know me, this is your appointed time. This is your appointment with God himself. And so he's sitting before you and he's wanting to interview. He wants to talk to you, not to condemn you, but to show you how you have access to him. And so if you want that, you want all that God has for you, you want his identity on your life, then right where you're at right now, you just say, Father God, I accept Jesus Christ as my savior, and the forgiver of my sins. And the best way I understand now, I ask you, Jesus, to come and be the leader of my life. Now, Father, I thank you for those that were praying that night. I just uh, acknowledged, acknowledged their prayer, Lord, and I ask that you seal it in their heart. And I thank you, Father, that you have written their name in the book of life. And Father, your children call by your name. Your children call by your name, Father. You have said that you no longer want them in the, the desert. You no longer want them in the darkness. But you want them to, to run unhampered and unfettered in their callings and in their security and in the fact that you know them. And so, Father, today I ask that that simple analogy with, with fingerprints, that analogy, Father, would be something they could take with them and that that's a good touch point and that they can grow in you. And I thank you, Father, again for my mothers and those who have given so, uh, so much, Father. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.